Hi guys, in this video we are going to continue on the organic chemistry and this video we are going to focus on the important organic substance. Now if you go back to the front page, you will be able to see that in our syllabus we have three important organic substances. They are aspirin, uh, detergents and condensation polymers. So in this video I aimed at covering aspirin and detergents and probably I will spend another video talking about the condensation polymers okay so let's get started page 86 now aspirin probably you guys have heard about that before the Chinese name of it is basically the direct translation I mean from the sound from the English pronunciation okay so probably you have heard about that um, this one is a very common painkiller However, we don't really use this anymore these days. Uh, instead, we will use something called uh, Panadol or Paracetamol. Probably, again, you have heard about that. Now, you may ask why. Why do we no longer using aspirin but using the Panadol instead? Well, we will look into the reason why just now. Okay, so stay tuned. Um, first of all, for aspirin, we want to talk about its medicinal effect. So, as a drug, it is able to relieve mild pain, um, not severe pain, like if you get into a serious injury, uh, Panadol doesn't really help to ease the pain. So, this one we're talking about, for example, headache or toothache, okay, that kind of pain. So, um, it is a very mild painkiller. Also, it can help to reduce inflammation and fever. Now this one, uh, these two effects in Chinese is pretty easy to uh, memorize, which is this one. Right? I'm pretty sure you have heard about this, okay? So reduce inflammation and treat mild pain. Right? So this is the major medicinal effect. Now aspirin also have a bonus effect, if you can put it. Uh, it can reduce the risk of having heart attack. Um, it's a little biology here. Um, usually when people have heart attack is when they have uh, some what we call plaque. Okay, some kind of solid, like when the blood clots, they becomes a solid. We call it the plaque, right? So when we have that plaque form within the blood vessel and that plaque will travel around the bloodstream and probably get caught at one of the coronary artery, coronary arteries. So you know coronary arteries supply blood to the heart muscle and we have three of them. Uh, if uh, one or more of these coronary arteries get blocked, then the heart, the cardiac muscle receive insufficient blood nutrients and they will uh, stop working and this is the reason why we have the heart attack. Um, so aspirin, one of its medicinal effects is to prevent blood clotting by thinning the blood. You can think about it as it sort of inhibits the blood pellet to uh, work. You know, blood pellet is responsible for forming uh, blood clots or the plaque inside. Uh, so uh, if there is injuries inside our blood vessel, then uh, aspirin can prevent the formation of that plaque and therefore reducing the risk of having heart attack. Alright, uh, enough biology, let's go back to chemistry. So now these are the, uh, of course, the desirable effects, the medicinal effects. However, as a drug, it also has side effects. So aspirin may irritate the stomach wall and causing peptic ulcers. So peptic means intestine, okay? Ulcers basically means wound, injury, okay? This one is like, um, not sure about um, whether it is written like this, but basically the, the wound or injury of the gastrointestinal uh, system, okay? Now, uh, it may also trigger allergic effect, so some people may be allergic to aspirin, and this one uh, is quite trivial. It may cause uh, some uh, problem in teenagers, okay? Now, um, actually the major side effect is this one. This is the major side effect that it irritates the stomach walls. 
the reason why they irritate the stomach walls is because uh, aspirin, this compound later on, we will talk about it, is slightly acidic. Slightly acidic. You can tell by its name. Um, the chemical name of aspirin is called acetyl salicylic acid, right? So you can tell it is actually a carboxylic acid. So that's why it will irritate the stomach wall and damaging the stomach wall, okay? Um, so just now I said that uh, we don't use aspirin anymore, we use Panadol. Actually, one of the reasons is because Panadol does not have this side effect. Panadol essentially have uh, no side effect. Uh, people say that when you uh, have 50, 50, 500 milligram Panadol pellet at one time, then you might have some mild problem with the gastrointestinal system. But we're talking about like, 50 pellets in one go, right? Who, who will actually do it? So you can basically take Panadol having no side effect at all, okay? So, so that's why um, aspirin is being phased out by the Panadol, okay? Now, let's talk about more of a chemistry, more of an organic chemistry perspective. So here we try to focus on the synthesis of aspirin. How do we make aspirin? Now, Actually, aspirin, or we call it acetyl salicylic acid, or salicylate, okay? This guy is coming from salicylic acid, okay? Salicylic acid. This one, again, probably you have heard about this in Chinese. This is what we call, okay? All right, so this one is actually a compound extracted from the bark of willow trees. Um, just some kind of trees and their bark consists of this uh, compound. Uh, so this compound is basically having a phenyl group with a hydroxyl group, uh, together it is a phenol, and we also have a carboxyl group, okay? And to prepare aspirin, we have to treat this one with ethanol acid. So you know that when you have an alcohol and an ethanol acid or uh, carboxylic acid, we can undergo esterification or condensation, okay? So we use concentrated sulfuric acid as the catalyst, heats under reflux for a long time, then we are able to form this one. This one is actually an ester, an ester, okay? Can you recognize this ester group over here? This ester functional group, okay? So this is, this is the formation of aspirin, and how do we make aspirin? from salicylic acid, okay? Now, make sure you know how to write this equation and um, make sure you know the raw material of aspirin, okay? And um, you may ask, hey, why do we have to do this conversion? Uh, in fact, both salicylic acid and uh, aspirin are having pain-killing effects. So both of them are able to treat mild pain. Uh, then why do we have to do such a conversion? The reason is because if you look at here, um, it has a carboxyl group and it also has a phenol group. And in fact, a phenol is a little bit acidic, it's a little bit acidic. So um, this salicylic acid is quite acidic by itself. If we uh, consume too much, then we have uh, serious uh, problems with our, our gastrointestinal system. So that's why a scientist try to reduce the acidity by reacting the phenol group with the ethanol acid. So in other words, this aspirin molecule is less acidic, okay, less acidic. So that's the reason why they have to do this. Uh, down here, if you look at the structure and the functional group, so aspirin is essentially an ester of a salicylic acid because like this is the salicylic acid and it forms an ester with the ethanol acid. So um, this is actually an ester but within this aspirin molecules, we have a couple of functional group, we have a carboxyl group, ester group, and a benzene ring. Now, a benzene ring is a structural part, but if the question asks you about the functional group, this one is called a phenyl group, phenyl functional group, okay? So we have all together uh, three functional groups uh, in aspirin, okay? Now, you may also look at this molecule. Now, do you think it is soluble in water. Now this molecule, um, it should be slightly soluble in water because you see we have a carboxyl group which is uh, very polar and it can form uh, extensive hydrogen bond with water 
So this carboxyl group makes it water soluble. Uh, also, the ester being a polar group, it can also form hydrogen bond to a lesser extent than carboxylic acid. So the ester group also sort of enabling aspirin to dissolve in water. However, is it like very soluble in water? Of course not, because we have a phenyl group, which is quite a large, bulky, non-polar group. So this phenyl group makes uh, makes it less soluble in water. Okay, so aspirin is soluble in water, but not very soluble in water. Okay. Now, and, and you can tell, of course, aspirin must be able to dissolve in water. Otherwise, how can it be absorbed into the bloodstream and get carried to the to the area where it exerts its effect? Actually, aspirin works uh, at your brain. Huh? Okay, they sort of inhibit the uh, detection of pain sensation. Uh, the details are very biochemistry, uh, so uh, so I, I don't spend too much time on that. Okay. Now let's look at the practice question, shall we? So this practice question uh, again, pause the video, try to attempt the question yourself, and then we check the answers. Okay, let's come back to here. So down here we have uh, salicylic acid. Okay. Salicylic acid. Now, salicylic acid is not aspirin. Huh? Aspirin is acetyl salicylic. Salicylic acid is the precursor. The precursor. Okay? You can. It's a precursor of aspirin. Okay? So, precursor means the compound immediately before uh, your targeted product. Okay? It's like. It's not like raw material. Raw material could be far different from the final product. Uh, precursor is just like, like after you do one or couple of steps on the precursor, then you have your target product. So that is the, the meaning of precursor. Okay? Usually one step up, okay, one step before precursor. Okay? Now state one medicinal effect, so easy, huh? okay? Uh, we leave mild pain, uh, uh, reduced fever, uh, okay? So you can just refer to the table on the left. Okay, um, salicylic acid can be converted into aspirin by reacting with ethanol acid. State the type of reaction. Now, for type of reaction, it would be best if we put down condensation. Condensation. Now, remember, uh, condensation is a type of reaction. <coughs> Esterification is an example of condensation reaction. In other words, condensation is the type of reaction. Esterification is a specific example of condensation reaction. Okay. Uh, write down the chemical equation. So basically, the one on the left. But I still want you to practice uh, writing chemical equation involving slightly complicated compounds. So we have. This is a salicylic acid. Reacts with ethanol acid. Make sure you put that reversible sign, otherwise, you get one mark detected. And don't forget, we have a water as the product. Okay? Now, part C is something that I haven't taught, but uh, probably you can think about it, you can deduce it if you're smart. So, here, aspirin can be converted into an ionic salt by reacting with dilute sodium hydroxide. So, uh, write a chemical equation for this reaction. So, aspirin, which is this one, let's put it down. So, this time I put it this way, okay, it doesn't matter. Actually, I can put it this way. Excuse me. Okay. Well, it doesn't matter how you put it, actually. Um, yeah. So, this one, it reacts with sodium hydroxide. So, you may think about, hey, what is this reaction? Now, uh, you know, we have 
couple of functional groups here. We have a benz, we have a phenol group, we have ester, we have carboxylic acid, and then we have sodium hydroxide. So you have to think, okay, which functional group will actually react with sodium hydroxide? Of course, phenol group will not react. Uh, will the ester group react? Now, the only reaction that an ester will undergo is hydrolysis. And hydrolysis, we have acid hydrolysis and alkaline hydrolysis. Eh? Ah, so we have a hydrolysis reaction going on here. Um, but bear in mind, for hydrolysis, we need to have heat under reflux. We need to heat it in order to proceed. Here, do we heat it? Ah, no heating, right? So hydrolysis of ester should not take place. Should not take place. So the remaining uh, functional group will be carboxyl group. So the carboxyl group being an acidic functional group, it is able to neutralize with sodium hydroxide. And you can also get the hint from here, ionic salt. So neutralization forms a salt, right? So actually the product would be like this, COO minus Na plus, okay? And then OOCCH3, this one does not change, and you form water, okay, as the product. So you see acid, base, salt and water. This, this is definitely a neutralization reaction, okay? All right, now CII. So some aspirin tablet is made into its ionic salt, which is a better pain, which has a better pain killing effect. So um, yeah, in fact, for aspirin, for those of you actually buy it from the uh, pharmaceutical company or local pharmacy, um, the aspirin is not exactly having a structure like this. Very often, they will give you in a form of sodium salt. So here, based on the structure of aspirin and its ionic salt, explain why the ionic salt has a better medicinal effect. Now, uh, this one is a challenging question. So first of all, the difference between the ionic salt and the uh, and and the acid here, of course, you can tell the original aspirin has a carboxyl group, and this is a salt. So you can tell you need to find out the difference between the two. Uh, of course, you can say, oh, this is acidic, this is less acidic, but would the acidity affect the pain killing effect? Not really, right? Just now we just discussed that even salicylic acid, even this one, has painkilling effect. The reason why we have to convert it into uh, aspirin is because we want to reduce the acidity. So the acidity may not have a lot of a lot of things to do with the painkilling effect. So we have to all, we have to think about from another perspective. So look at this too. You see, they emphasize a lot of the ionic salt. So ionic salt, when compared to a molecule, this one should be much more water-soluble, much more water-soluble, okay? So it dissolves much better than the aspirin molecule. Now think about if a drug is much more soluble in water, how does it relate to the pain-killing effect? Actually, I did talk about that before. Um, we say that the drugs needs to dissolve into the blood, I mean, to be more precise, the water of the blood, and then from the bloodstream, it gets carried to the part of the body where it exerts its effect, right? So if it has a better water solubility, then it can be carried out to the area to exert its effect much faster, much more efficient. So this is the reason why, okay? Um, actually, we have a specific term for that. We call it bioavailability. So if you have a higher water solubility, it has a higher bioavailability to the body, okay? So like this is how we explain uh, for this question. So first of all, we need to say that the ionic salt is much more water soluble than aspirin. The ionic salt is much more water soluble than aspirin. Okay? So then we will say that, therefore, 
the ionic salt can dissolve faster in water of blood and get carried to the site of effect much faster. Okay, so that's the explanation. Therefore, the ionic salts can dissolve faster in water of blood and get carried to the site of effect much faster. Okay, that's the idea. Okay, down here, Again, this one, I did talk about that. It says that, in fact, both the salicylic acid and aspirin have painkilling effect. However, salicylic acid is more likely to cause stomach ulcers, which is a reason why. Um, so here, basically, you need to explain in terms of their acidity. So basically, you can say salicylic acid is more acidic or is a stronger acid than aspirin. Okay? Or you can say salicylic acid dissolves in water to give a higher H plus concentration. Okay? Something like that. Okay? So that should do it. That would be uh, all we have to know about aspirin. Okay? Now let's move on to another important organic substance. So here, soaps, soaps and soapless detergents. Now, before I talk about this too, um, first of all, I need to make sure you know what detergents are. So detergents are what we use when we wash dishes, right? When we wash the dishes, we apply the detergents, right? And uh, most of us, we are using the soapless detergents. Um, so very often we simply say detergents, but actually we are doing the we are using the soapless detergent. Now soap or soap P detergent is something that is quite outdated, but still we want to know the difference. We want to know uh, why it is so phased out by the soapless detergent. Okay. Now um, so starting from here, uh, soapless detergent we will say soapless detergent now for soap. P detergent or soaps, okay, these two are the same. So, um, yeah, we just use soap for simplicity's sake. Okay, now first of all, we want to know the difference between soaps in terms of uh, the structures, in terms of their origin, so that means how they are being made, where do they come from, the raw material. And we also want to learn about uh, its action of cleaning and something like that, or their, their production. Okay. So first of all, let's look at uh, the structure. Let's look at soap first. Now, for soap, no matter if soap or soapless detergent, they have some common features. Common features. Now you see here, this one is a sodium salt of a carboxylic acid. Can you tell? This is a sodium salt of carboxylic acid. In other words, you have a carboxylic acid that is neutralized with the sodium hydroxide and the salt would be this one, okay? However, this one, you see, it has a very, very long hydrocarbon tail. Very, very long hydrocarbon tail. We're talking about like 16, uh, 17 carbons in total. Uh, whenever we talk about detergent, we are talking about long hydrocarbon chain, uh, which is talking about more than 10 carbons involved, okay? So, you see, for a detergent molecules, it must have a very long hydrocarbon tail and it must have a part where it bears a charge. It bears a charge, maybe a negative charge, maybe a positive charge, but it must have a part where it has a charge, okay? Now, for these two structural features, we want to learn more about that. Let's look at the bottom, the bottom of the notes. Now, this part, structural features of a detergent molecule, please, Highlighted, very important, very important. 
if the past paper is going to ask detergent, it is going to ask about the structural features. So bear in mind, very important. So first of all, you have this long tail. We call it hydrophobic hydrocarbon tail. Okay? Now, hydrocarbon tail, you, you will understand because it looks like a tail and then it is made by hydrocarbon. But what do you mean by hydrophobic? Now, hydrophobic here, hydro means water. Okay? Phobic comes from the word phobia. That means afraid. Afraid. Okay? Afraid. So in, in Chinese, this is called. Okay? Afraid of water. Afraid of water. Okay? So you can tell if it afraid of water, then it is likely to be insoluble in water, right? Because if it likes water, it will definitely mix with water, right? So this hydrophobic basically means it is insoluble in water, okay? If it is insoluble in water, it will likely to dissolve in non-polar solvents such as oil, okay? So hydrophobic uh, basically means non-polar, basically means non-polar, but uh, you know, even non-polar molecules are able to dissolve in water, right? Some non-polar molecules, such as like chlorine, okay, they are uh, soluble in water. But here, uh, hydrophobic means it is insoluble in water, okay? <coughs> and here, we have the, the part with a charge. So this part is called ionic head. Now, again, it's quite easy to understand. Ionic, because it has a charge. Head, because it looks like the head of the whole structure. Okay, so ionic head. Hydrophilic. Again, <coughs> hydro means water. Philic comes from the word philia, means love. So this one in Chinese is called Okay. So hydrophilic. So you can tell the hydrophilic part is definitely soluble in water. Okay? And you can tell. Bearing a charge makes it very soluble in water. Okay? Now, so remember, no matter you are a soap or soapless detergent, the molecule must have these two structural features. It must have a hydrocarbon tail that is hydrophobic, and it must have an ionic head that is hydrophilic. Okay? And the hydrophilic ionic head, it could be negatively charged, it could also be positively charged. Okay? And also, because of having a long tail and a head, it actually looks like a tadpole, right? It looks like a tadpole. So later on, when we try to draw some diagram to illustrate some action of detergent molecules, we will use a tadpole shape to represent the detergent molecules, okay? All right, so after you understand this one, let's go back to the top here. Let's look at the structure. So you see, I use the same color. So the red part here is the hydrophobic hydrocarbon tail. The blue part is the hydrophilic ionic head. Okay? Uh, and also, you know, uh, if you have a negative charge, you cannot just hang around with a negative charge. You must have a positive charge to balance the charge, right? So very often, this one is a sodium ion or potassium ion. Just make sure you choose a group one metal ion so that you are always soluble in water, okay? Because you are not soluble in water, how can you clean, okay? So that's the idea. Now, uh, if you look at the soapless detergent, okay, uh, you try to compare the structure, okay, between the soap and the soapless detergent. Now, there are something very similar, which is the tail. Both of them has a very long hydrocarbon tail. The, the only difference is the ionic head, the ionic head. You see this one, for soap, it must have a COO minus. Okay, a carboxylate ion head, carboxylate ion. Let me put it down. It must have a carboxylate ion. Okay, but for soapless detergent, it could be a lot of different different form. Usually, you will see a sulfate ion. Okay, sulfate ion, or this kind of benzene sulfonate ion or phenyl sulfonate ion, okay? 
it doesn't matter which one, as long as you see the sound phase, something like that, then it should be a soapless detergent. So you can tell the difference between soap and soapless detergent by looking at the head. Okay, that's the idea. So that would be the, the difference in terms of the structure. Let's look at how they are being formed, how they are being made. Now, first of all, let's talk about soapless detergent, just one word, petroleum. So soapless detergent, they are made from petroleum, or you can tell, you can say that it is a, a product from petroleum, okay? It is a product made from petroleum. For soaps, they are made from a more um, renewable source, which is the fat and oil. So fat is the uh, animal lipid, oil is a plant lipid. Um, and the process of making the soap is called subponification. Subponification. Okay? So, um, it's quite complicated, but this equation, again, I have to put a lot of stars here. Okay? Very important equations. Okay? Now, first of all, you see this huge molecule. Let me make it bigger. I need to explain this one. Okay? So this molecule is a triester. In chemistry, we can put it as triester. Hey, why do we call it triester? Because it has three ester functional group. We have over here, this is an ester, this is an ester, this is an ester, right? So that's why we call it a triester. Now, when we have an ester, you know ester is coming from an alcohol, and a carboxylic acid, right? So, the carboxylic acid, you can tell, these are the carboxylic acid, right? These are the carboxylic acid, the red part here. So we have three carboxylic acid, okay? C double bond O, right? And, but what about alcohol? Do we have three separate alcohol? It turns out that it is not the case. For triester, for animal fat, it has one single alcohol with three hydroxyl group. Okay? So this one is actually like this before the esterification. Before esterification, it is, it is like this. Okay? This one, we call it glycerol. Glycerol. Okay, glycerol. So this is a tri alcohol, a trial. Okay, uh, the IUPAC name is propane. One, two, three, trial. Okay. So this triester is made by one glycerol molecule and three carboxylic acid. Now this carboxylic acid, we have a name. We call this fatty acid. Okay, fatty acid. Okay fatty acids. So we have three of them, we have three of them, okay? So that's the idea. Now, when we have this fat molecule, we want to undergo saponification. Actually, this so-called saponification is actually an alkaline hydrolysis, alkaline hydrolysis, okay? Again, as an ester, we only have one reaction, which is hydrolysis. So you either do acid hydrolysis or alkaline hydrolysis. This time, it is alkaline hydrolysis. Okay, so because we have three ester functional group, we need to have three. We need to use three moles of sodium hydroxide. So that's why there's a three here. So basically, what it does is they kind of cut, cut the ester bond, cut the ester bond, cut the ester bond. As we cut it open, we put back the atoms, right? We put back, put back the hydrogen atom back to the hydroxyl group. We put back the OH back to the carboxyl group. Okay. So you see, on the right-hand side here, it will give you a glycerol molecule just now, okay? After, after you give the hydrogen atom back to the three hydroxyl group, then you will form the glycerol, and then you also form the sodium salt, okay? Again, if you forgot, when we do hydrolysis of uh, ester, you can first think about as adding, adding the OH back to the carboxyl group, so it goes back to COOH, COOH, COOH. And after that, and after that, uh, you know, COOH is an acid, 
but here it is an alkaline medium, so that's why uh, it will further undergo neutralization to form uh, sodium stearate here. Okay, so that's the idea. So make sure you know how to write this equation and make sure you get the stoichiometry correct, the mole ratio 3 to 3 here. Because we have three fatty acids, so it forms three sodium salts. And this sodium salt is basically the salt, right? Because you see the long hydrocarbon tail, right? The tail is like here. This is the tail, right? And this is the head, right? This is the head, okay? Now remember, the head doesn't include the sodium, huh? doesn't include the sodium ion. Because you think about it, when this one is used in action, the sodium ion will be uh, dissociated, will simply go away. And the whole soap molecule only in, includes the uh, carboxylate ion as the head and the tail. Okay? The sodium ion will be gone. So that's why I would not count it as part of the head. Okay? Now, down here, action in hard water. So, uh, first of all, what is hard water? Now, hard water doesn't mean that it is hard, like when you punch on it, you get hurt. No. Uh, hard water is talking about how much dissolved ions in the water. So, for ions, we are focusing on magnesium ion and calcium ion. So, in other words, when, you, when your water sample has a lot of magnesium ion and a lot of calcium ion, then that one is called hard water. Uh, in contrast to soft water, soft water has uh, very few magnesium ion and calcium ion dissolved in it. In Hong Kong, our tap water is hard water because um, if you remember in Form 1, we talk about the water treatment plant. Uh, one step is that we add something called alum, alum to facilitate the sedimentation of uh, suspended particles. Those alum contains magnesium ions probably some calcium ion as well, uh, but mostly magnesium ion, okay? So, so that's why we have uh, 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 these ions dissolved in it. Plus, you know, those water coming from the freshwater stream, okay, coming from Dongjiang water, uh, of course we will have ions inside, right? Think about all those, like, limestone rocks, they would obviously dissolve to a certain extent into the water and which provide us with calcium ions, okay? So anyway, our water in Hong Kong, they are hard water, okay? Now for soap, soap detergent doesn't work, doesn't work in hard water. The reason is because this magnesium ion and calcium ion will actually form a white precipitate uh, together with the soap molecule. And this white precipitate is called scum, okay, scum. So you don't want to wash your dishes, but at the same time you keep forming something white in color, white solid, right? That would definitely not desirable, okay? Uh, so this is also the reason why, like I said, uh, the detergent that we use in our home, in the kitchen, they are all soapless detergent. Uh, we, we, simply because we can't use soap in Hong Kong, okay? However, for soapless detergent, it works in hot water. It works in both hot water and uh, soft water, simply because um, the magnesium sulfate or the magnesium benzyl sulfonate ion, they are relatively soluble in water, so they won't form the scum. Okay? So that's the idea. Now, down here, the pH. pH. So, soap detergent must be alkaline, must, must be mildly alkaline because the formation of soap is to use the sodium hydroxide and this one is definitely slightly alkaline. If this is slightly acidic, then this one will become ethanoic acid, I mean will become carboxylic acid, then it does not bear a charge and therefore loses its cleaning function. Um, plus, you know this one, this one is the um, is the salt of a weak acid. You know, the salt of a weak acid is slightly alkaline. Okay, do you remember those titration curve? The salt of a weak acid is slightly alkaline. Okay? So that's why the salt, they are always alkaline. However, for soap less detergent, they could be acidic, it could be neutral, it could also be alkaline. It depends on what kind of ionic head 
did you install into the hydrocarbon chain? Okay. So that's the idea. Now, on the right hand side here, we have two properties that is exhibited by detergent molecules. Okay. Uh, one is called wetting property, another one is called emulsifying property. Now, wetting property is less important, but emulsifying property is much more important. Okay, in the exam they will ask this one much more than wetting property. Now, let's talk about it one by one. Now, wetting property. So it comes from the word wet. Now, what do you mean by wet? Uh, when you get a place wet, this is when you accidentally pour water probably onto the surface and the water sp spread out and the whole floor, the whole platform get wet, right? So what if the water doesn't spread out? What if the water kind of hold themselves together? So when you pour the water down on the ground, it doesn't spread out, it just hold together as like a water sphere then do you think your floor is still wet? Probably not. So here, the wetting property is talking about the ability of a liquid to spread out, to spread out, okay? If the liquid can spread out very uh, extensively, it simply cover up all the surface of the platform, then it is definitely very wet and it has a very high wetting property. But on the other hand, if it is a liquid that doesn't spread out much, comparatively, doesn't spread out much, then we will say that it has not much of a wetting property. So it all boils down to whether the liquid spread out. And whether or not the water spread out deter uh, uh, is determined by the intermolecular force. Simply put, if the liquid molecule has a strong intermolecular force, then the water molecule hold themselves together very strongly. So they were unlikely to be separated. Think about when we talk about spreading, spreading over. Essentially, we are having the molecule separated far apart, right? So if you want to separate the molecules far apart, then you have to overcome the intermolecular force, okay? So if you have a strong intermolecular force holding the molecules together, they are less likely to spread out and therefore having not much of a wetting property. In other words, in other situation, when you have a liquid sample where the intermolecular force is weaker, then it doesn't take a lot of energy to overcome the force and therefore that liquid has a much higher wetting property, they are more likely to spread out. So actually that is the idea. Now, here, this is to show you a very uh, distinctive example to illustrate the wetting property, which is water. Now, very often we see uh, pictures, like if we have a leaf, okay, if you have a, a piece of leaf here, okay, and, you know, in, in the, during the dawn, during the, the, the morning, um, we see those water bits, right, the water bits kind of, okay, uh, resting on a on a pieces of leaf, right? So it's like some kind of uh, okay, okay, like uh, some water beads, okay. Now, why water is able to form a small bead on top of a leaf? The reason is because water it has extra extra strong hydrogen bond. So the water molecules are held by very strong hydrogen bond. So you think about it, like this is the water bead on the surface. And these water molecules on the surface, they tend to attract each other by very strong hydrogen bond. So they kind of tighten up, tighten up the surface, tighten up the surface. Think about it, because if you want to, if you want to make it flat, if you want to make it flat, you are trying to overcome this strong hydrogen bond, which is a little bit difficult, right? So if you have a strong intermolecular force, you tend to tighten up the water body, prevent it to spread over. So that's why water does not have a lot of wetting property. However, when you add the detergent,
when you add the detergent. This is what happens when you add the detergent. Now, when you add the detergent inside, so remember, detergent has a hydrophilic ionic head and a hydrophobic hydrocarbon tail. So the head will be inserted into the water surface and the tail will be outside, okay? But this is a little bit exaggerated, but just to show you. Now, when you have the detergent molecule inserted inside, so the water, the hydrogen bond of the water at the surface is weakened, is much more weakened. Okay? Think about the intermolecular force between the hydrocarbon tail is simply uh, when the valve's force. It is like beyond compare. Therefore, um, the hydrogen bond of the water layer at the surface is weakened, making, making it to be more likely to spread out and therefore increasing the wetting property of a detergent solution or the, or the original uh, water body. Okay? So, it will tend to what? It will tend to lie flat due to gravity. Due to gravity. Okay? Due to gravity. In fact, this one, it is like, like struggling. It's combating, combating the gravity because the gravity is pulling you down, right? So um, there is a force pulling it down. But because of the hydrogen bond tightened up, so there is no net force acting to the water body. That's why the water bit doesn't, doesn't uh, spread out. But here, once your uh, force, the intermolecular force is weaker, then the gravitational pull is stronger than the, uh, the tension at the, at the surface, and therefore uh, there's a net force acting downward, flatten out uh, the water layer. Okay? Some physics kicks in, probably, hopefully you can understand. If you don't understand, it's fine, it is not the, 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 the DSC focus. Okay, so down here, this is important, this one you need to understand. Emulsifying property. Uh, emulsifying. Okay. Um, it, this one is the milk, right? It's related to milk. Uh, why is it related to milk? Because milk is actually an emulsion. An emulsion. Okay. Now, what do you mean by emulsion? Emulsion basically is a type of mixture where you have water. And solid mixed very evenly, very evenly. Now you know uh, milk is essentially a mixture of water and animal fats. You know that, like milk is essentially water and animal fat. However, if you simply buy a piece of animal fat, you dump it into water, you don't have a milk, right? Because simply the fat sink at the bottom. Even you add oil, you know, oil doesn't mix with water pretty well, right? So, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't simply mix the two together. But you may think, eh, how milk is able to form a stable mixture, even mixture of fat and water? The reason is because they have something inside that enables the fat to mix with water very stably very evenly. And that substance is what we call emul emulsifying agent, or that substance is having the emulsifying property. Okay, So here, detergent is having the emulsifying property, meaning that detergent is able to assist on mixing of two originally invisible liquid together. Okay, Now here, if you look at the picture, look at the diagram. Now, originally, you have water and oil. They are two immiscible liquids. Doesn't mix, okay? Now, when you add the detergent molecule, what is going on is, because the detergent molecule is having the hydrophilic ionic head and the hydrophobic hydrocarbon tail, the head will be inserted into water, the tail will remain in the oil. So they will arrange like this, okay? Now, this, this one, it doesn't mix. So, in order to mix them, we need to shake it. We need to shake it. Now, when you shake it, then the oil layer will be broken down into oil droplets. Will be broken down into oil droplets. When they're broken down into oil droplets, then the detergent molecule also arrange themselves on the droplet like this, like this. So, with the tail inserted into the droplet, the head uh, on the outside of the droplet. Now, once this droplet is formed, now there is a name. This one is called 
mesos, mesos. This oil droplet is called mesos. Okay? But even you don't know this word, you can simply say oil droplet. Okay? Now you notice the head, they are all negatively charged, or at least they are likely charged head, right? Negative, negative. So you will expect to see repulsion, right? Repulsion between the droplets, right? You will expect to see repulsion between the droplets. So such a repulsion will prevent the droplet from fusing together to form the oil layer. So that's why uh, adding the detergent allows the oil to maintain as oil droplets. Actually, for milk, the milk that we drink, actually it consists of water and the fat droplet, fat droplet. So that's why they can evenly distribute it in the, in the water, okay? Plus, the story doesn't end here. You see, this oil droplet is having so many negative charge on the surface, which makes the oil droplet water soluble, water soluble. So this oil droplet is water soluble. So um, in the case of milk, that's why the fat droplet can mix with water pretty well because they are all water soluble. Okay. Now, when it comes to dish washing, if you're washing the dish with oil dirt, then once you converted those oil dirt into this oil droplet, and this oil droplet is soluble in water, so when you flush it down with the water, you can easily erase those oil stain. Okay, so this is how it works. Okay, so you see, now here, these are important Keywords I want you to underline. So the negative charge on the surface allows the oil droplet to dissolve in water, easily wash away by water. Okay. Also, the repulsion on the negative charges prevents the droplet from joining together. Okay. And it also allows stable emulsion to take place. So all these are the keywords actually. Okay. So if you are asked to explain the cleaning action or the emulsifying property of detergent, this is the key. This is the key. Okay? If you memorize this, you got full marks. Okay? Uh, just one more thing, you have to shake it. You need to shake it. If you don't shake it, if you simply add the detergent, it doesn't really help. Okay? You need to shake it as well. And of course, when you're explaining this, you also have to explain using the structural features of detergent. So you also have to talk about the orientation of detergent molecules, okay? Like the head in water, tails in soil. You need to mention it. So basically, this diagram, very important, very important. Okay, this whole picture, very important, okay? Very important. Right? Now lastly, not actually not very lastly, we still got one experiment to discuss. Um, here, water pollution by the discharge of detergent. So um, when we use a lot of detergent, especially in some restaurant where they often wash their dishes, right? Uh, so we may discharge a lot of uh, effluent. Uh, containing a lot of detergents. So what are the bad things about detergent being emitted, uh, yeah, being, uh, uh, being uh, emitted to the, to the water, okay? The reason is because, first of all, uh, some detergents, for example, the soapy detergent, because they are coming from plant oil and uh, animal fats, so they are actually food for bacteria or microorganisms. So if you have a lot of those soap detergent, then bacteria will feed on, feed on those detergent and as they do so, they will use some the oxygen in water so the organism may die due to suffocation and if the microorganism uh, secrete toxin, it may also kill the aquatic organism. Also in detergent, especially the soap less detergent, they may add in some phosphate additives. So phosphate are the goodies for Algae for el algae, so it may encourage the algal bloom. Okay, so these are the uh, 
environmental problem associated with detergents. Okay. All right. Now again, we have some practice questions. So how about we pause the video and then you guys try to do it and then we will check the answers. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so we have compound X which is a major component of castor oil, okay? Uh, okay, blah, blah, blah. Identify all the functional group present in the compound X, all the functional group. So first of all, we have ester, okay? We have ester group. We have here CC double bond. And we also have this one, right? The hydroxyl group. Don't put down alcohol group, ah, hydroxyl group. Okay, that should do it. How many cis trans isomer do compound X has? Now this one is actually quite a challenging question. Okay, this one is quite a challenging question. Now you see we have three double bonds here, right? So, you know, one double bond can have a cis trans, right? So, does it mean that we have like six of them? Um, not precisely correct, because uh, we can have like cis cis cis, right? Cis trans trans, something like that. Okay, but some of them could be, uh, could be the same. Could be the same. So this one is quite a difficult question, I would say. Um, so let me think. Of course, we can have cis cis cis. This one has to be one of them. Okay, and if we keep the first one being cis, the second one also cis, but this one is trans. Of course, this is one of them. Okay. And then we can also have cis trans trans. This is definitely one of them. Okay. And then we can have trans trans trans. This is definitely one of them. Okay. And uh, if you start to have, for example, like uh, trans cis cis, this is actually the same as this one. Because the top and the bottom are the same, so this one is the same, okay, so this one is not. And you can also have trans, trans, cis, but this one again is the same as this one, so this one is not. So all together, I think there are four of them, four of them, okay. Alright, now C1 here, uh, compound X can be converted to compound Y as shown below. So this is compound Y. So how this one is coming from this one, okay? But here, outline a synthetic root with no more than three steps to convert X into Y. You should include all the reagents, okay? Now this one is quite complicated, so but we still have to try. Um, so first of all, we need to put down this huge compound down here, okay? So we can have compound X just to save time to compound Y. Okay, so compound X, first of all, you see we have a hydrocarbon chain here with no functional group, no double bond, no hydroxyl. So we have to think about a way how to get rid of those hydroxyl group. Okay. Now, first of all, the hydroxyl group can be converted into CC double bond by dehydration, right? So probably we will do a dehydration first. Okay. So here, first of all, we will add Al2O3 and then we heat it. Okay. We do a catalytic dehydration. Then we should have. So when we do a dehydration, it probably takes place here. Okay, and the rest should be the same, you just copy.
okay? These three are the same. So basically we undergo a dehydration so that the, all the hydroxyl groups are gone, okay? Now the next step is we want to get rid of the CC double bond. So in this case, we, we want to do a hydrogenation. So we do a hydrogenation, we use hydrogen, and then we use platinum as the catalyst, so we don't have to heat it. Then after all these double bonds are gone, then actually the rest of them is the hydrocarbon chain, the hydrocarbon chain. So if you are smart, basically it is something looks like this one, okay? So like the, the hydrocarbon tail here would then become this one, okay? So here we will have CH2, CH, CH2. And after that, we will do a alkaline hydrolysis with sodium hydroxide and we have to heat it. Okay? Then we will form our compound Y. Okay? So that would be our answer for the synthetic wood. It's quite complicated, I understand. Okay, so CII, compound Y is clean, eh? Explain whether it is a soap or soapless detergent. Of course, it is a soap, okay, because it has a carboxylate ionic head. Carboxylate ionic head, okay? If you don't know this one, you can say COO minus NA plus, okay? Alright, so here, when compound Y is shaken with a mixture of oil and water, a stable emulsion is formed. Explain how compound Y can form a stable emulsion. A suitably drawn and labeled diagram is also acceptable. So here, uh, we can explain it using sentence first, and then we also substantiate it with a diagram. Okay, so first of all, we need to state that, okay, um, Oil breaks into oil droplets upon shaking. Okay? So they form oil droplets. And then you will say about uh, the structural features of the detergent. So we say that the hydrophilic. Ionic head, okay, face towards or oh, I should put it this way, sorry. Hydro the hydrophilic ionic head are uh, arranged it on the surface. Of oil droplets while the hydrophobic hydrocarbon tail okay, are inserted into the oil droplet. Okay, and then we will talk about okay the oil droplet become water soluble and the repulsion of the negative charges on the surface prevents 
the droplet from joining. Okay, so the oil droplet becomes water soluble and the repulsion of the negative charges on the surface prevents the droplets from joining to form the layer of oil. Okay, so that's the idea. Now, how about we substantiate our answer with some label the diagram? Of course, that's why I left a space here. So you can draw oil droplet, maybe two of them, and then you draw, of course, the detergent molecule. Now you don't have to use different color, okay, because in the exam, uh, they cannot distinguish your color. They just do black and white scanning. But you know, here just to have a better illustration. Now all these are having negative charge, you know, negative charge. Okay. And it's a label the diagram, right? So we have this uh, oil droplet. And then we have let me make it a little bit bigger. Here, this is the hydrophobic, hydrophilic ionic head. And then we have this one, the hydrophobic hydrocarbon tail. And then, last but not least, we try to illustrate the repulsion between oil droplets. Okay, so that should that should do it. That should do it. Okay. Now. Down here, du -du -du -du. so explain why compound Y loses its cleaning ability when used together with the following solution. Now, if we use it with calcium chloride solution, so you know that it will form scum, right? So, because okay, uh, calcium ion uh, reacts with compound Y to form insoluble precipitate or form scum, okay? Right? So, which makes the... I think that should be enough, okay? You don't, need, you don't need to say it makes the dishes dirty, okay? That should be enough, okay? And sulfuric acid is because uh, in acidic medium, the carboxylate group will be converted into carboxyl group. Okay, which does not, or so the ionic head uh, no longer exists. Okay, so it's like it is changing from COO minus into COOH. So it does not have the uh, ionic head, then it cannot have any cleaning properties. Alright, so two here, which of the following compounds is not suitable for cleaning oily dirt? So um, the first one here, definitely okay, because this is basically a surplus detergent. B is definitely okay, this is a, a uh, sorry, this is a surplus detergent, this is a surplus detergent. This one, A, you see, we have a positive Ionic head. Is that okay? Yes, why not? Okay, 
because like I said, for soapless detergent, it could be negatively charged, it could be positively charged. It doesn't matter. Think about it. Uh, even though your oil droplet is having positive charge on the surface, it can still repel. It can still repel uh, the other oil droplets and also make it soluble in water. Okay? And lastly, D, this one is not okay because it's too short. Too short. So Actually, this one is too soluble in water, too soluble in water. And this part, the hydrocarbon tail, doesn't insert it firmly onto the oil layer. So this one is too short, okay? So that's why this one doesn't work, okay? Okay, so the last part here, let's quickly talk about it. So this part is uh, the laboratory preparation of soap. Um, actually, you know you can make soap in the lab, it's not too difficult. And there are uh, three important stages. First of all, of course, we perform the alkaline hydrolysis or the saponification. So basically, we use a castor oil, um, our, our raw material, we add it to sodium hydroxide solution, and then we will uh, heat it because alkaline hydrolysis requires heating. And we also need to stir it, so we have a magnetic stir bar here. So as the reaction proceeds, um, you start to have this lather or foam, okay? Because you know, when you shake, you kind of mix the soap together, it forms the foam. Uh, but when the formation of foam stops, then the reaction is done, then you can remove the heating. Uh, okay, so like this is the reaction involved, okay? Now after that, it forms the soap molecule in this form, but this one is slightly soluble in water. So once you have you are done, once you have done with the heating, you still got most of the soap uh, dissolved into the solution. So how can you get the soap out of it? We have to do a process called sorting out. Sorting out. The idea is we, we won't add a lot of sodium chloride solution, we add saturated sodium chloride solution into the hot mixture. Uh, the idea is because the soap molecules, uh, it dissolve partially in water and this is actually a reversible process. You may have not yet learned about equilibrium, but the idea is it is slightly soluble in water. And when we add a lot of sodium ion inside, then uh, the equilibrium will be shifted to the left hand side. Basically, it makes the soap much less soluble in water. Much less soluble in water. Okay? So, by adding the saturated sodium chloride solution, the high sodium ion prevents the soap from dissolving in water. Therefore, we solidify the soap. Okay? So, actually, we will, have, we will expect to see white solid form after adding the sodium chloride solution, the saturated sodium chloride solution. And after that, we want to collect the white solid. We want to undergo filtration. Filtration. So we filter it, and then we will uh, rinse the residue, which is the soap, with minimum amount of deionized water. This is to remove any sodium hydroxide stick on the surface. And then we dry the soap by pressing uh, with filter papers, or we can uh, heat it under and over. Okay, so like this is the experiment of preparing soap. Okay, so um, I think that's it for today's lesson. So I will stop it here, and next time we will talk about the condensation polymer. All right, so see you guys later. Bye bye.